lots of lots of new uh, oil discoveries there in coincidentally 2000 to 2001 and then to invade Iraq uh, one can't help but see a pattern here it, it, it seems evident to me that uh, that 9/11 was in effect a, a, a kind of pretext for the U.S. to expand its military hold on the two most important oil-producing regions of the planet. There are a number of elites, a number of, of very influential policy advisors, a lot of people who went on to form part of the administration knew that peak oil was coming. They knew that they would not be able to survive peak oil without um, without having this massive militarization of policy and thirdly that they needed to do that on the back of a, of a drastic uh, attack or perception of a threat on in, in invasion to the United States and this is what 9-11 provided. In our work the fundamental uh, job that we do for people is in understanding what's really going on and trying to understand what is behind events and what is motivating people that's different from passing judgment on it. We're not trying to make value judgments. Uh, we try to eschew value judgments as much as possible, as a matter of fact, in, in, our, in our consulting work. We are very interested in what really happened on 911, is the short answer. Well, you have uh, four options uh, to declare 9-11. Uh, uh, one is it was a strike out of, the blue, out of the blue, nobody knew anything. It was the first version the American administration told the public. Uh, then uh, they knew a lot, uh, but in different agencies, and the picture was, uh, was so, so difficult to put together that they couldn't find out what was happening, what was uh, in the future. Uh, and uh, I think it break, uh, has broken down, but the, the administration is fighting on this line. Uh, the third option is they let it happen. They knew something or they, they knew the whole story and let it happen because they could use it in order to bring about war against up to 60 states, as they said later on. Um, and the, 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 third, the fourth uh, version is they, they organized it or were part of organizing it. And the, the way uh, it, it happened um, is, is so strange and the unwillingness of the administration to clear up all the environment uh, is so strong uh, uh, that I finally come to the, to the belief that it must be a steered operation, covered operation. Yeah. <laughs> When I started looking through the 9-11 Commission report, I was, I was outraged. Uh, I mean, here was a, a book that had shot to the top of the bestseller lists, and Americans, millions of Americans, were looking to this, this report, this book, to tell them what actually happened on September 11th, 2001. And they were doing so under the assumption that there had been a clear, open inquiry into the events, that all of the relevant questions had been asked, and evidence had been provided. And this clearly was not the case. Well, the, the Keene report um, on 9-11, which was uh, finally set up, uh, I think is not a serious examination of what happened and what the causes were. I say that, uh, first of all, because uh, clearly the Bush administration didn't want to do it. They resisted all the calls um, for an official inquiry for several months. And what actually finally persuaded them to do this was not the politicians in Congress. It was uh, the families, the wives of those who were killed at 9-11. The first thing it does is, is name the, uh, the 19 hijackers, the mostly uh, Saudi nationals. Uh, but, of course, we, we heard within days of, of the events that something like five or six of these people were still alive and well and living in the Middle East. Why wasn't this addressed in the 9-11 uh, Commission report? Why, weren't, uh, you know, why, why wasn't there some inquiry as to who were the real hijackers if, in fact, the people who had been identified were clearly not the right people? 
and on the day itself, <clears throat> which I think is the most significant evidence, the first plane hit at uh, 8.46 a.m., the uh, Southern Tower at uh, about 9.05 a.m., uh, the third plane hit the Pentagon at 9.38 a.m. They knew there was a hijack um, between 8.10 and 8.20 in the morning, let's say 8.15, so they knew half an hour before the first plane, three quarters of an hour before the second plane, and an hour and a half before the third plane hit their targets. And not once in that time did they scramble a warplane to intercept. Now that is just staggering when first of all they had Andrews Air Base which is 10 miles west of Washington uh, with F-16s with a top speed of 1500 miles an hour. They could have been over the scene within a minute or two. Why were none of them scrambled? Uh, and uh, secondly you might think, well, there was chaos, no one knew what to do, it was a catastrophe, but... Just standard operating procedure. When a plane is off course, fighter jets are notified. Fighter jets go out to see if the plane's having a problem or just, well, what the problem is, because the plane's obviously off course. And for the year before 9-11-01, fighter jets were called out on 67 occasions. So the question is, when we knew, we knew of at least four planes were off course. And there's words that it was even up to 11. But where were the fighter jets? They weren't there. Now, from our research, which people wouldn't know, we have now found out that there were 15 exercises going on that day involving all the fighter jets in the northeastern portion of the United States. What are the odds of that occurring? Like zero? I mean, or, you know, 100%. I mean, 100% they couldn't occur without a fix being in. <laughs> Why had these these towers fallen so quickly, these steel framed towers? No steel framed um, buildings had ever collapsed before because of fire. Why wasn't there a proper inquiry? I think something like $600,000 was spent to investigate why the Twin Towers collapsed. Meanwhile, something like $52 million were spent to investigate whether Bill Clinton had had an affair. This is absurd. There's been many fires in many buildings before and even after. And I think uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I'm from, right outside of Philadelphia, there was the Meridian building fire and smoke throughout the building. Several firemen were killed in that fire. Building didn't fall down. Buildings don't fall down, never did before, never did after. A prime example is what occurred in uh, February of 2005. A 45, 50-story building in Madrid, Spain, burned out of control. Wildfires. It was on all the TV shows and networks. The building was totally gutted. Still stood afterwards. Still stood there. Taking it down, I, I witnessed it myself. They're taking it down now, steel beam by steel beam. Concrete and steel buildings do not fall down from fires. I know it's hard for people to believe, but it's our position that they came down because they were imploded or explosives occurred. Fact is, building number seven, across the street from the North and South Tower, had some fires in it, but no plane hit it. At 5.20 in the afternoon, the owner of the building, Larry Silverstein, receives a phone call from the fire department saying they can't put out the fire. So he said, pull the building. Pull the building means implode the building. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. And it came down in its own footprint. That's significant because the North and South Tower also came down in their own footprint.